Hi, everybody. Hi. I'm really sorry to interrupt because I can see some incredible conversations going on, uh, but we do want to move through our program here, and we've got so many exciting things to do tonight. So uh, welcome, as I said before. It's great to have everybody here. It's a really good, large, wonderful group. Uh, we've had a great day for the advisory board talking about a whole lot of different things, including a new MPA and certificate set of programs for GSPP to help increase our visibility and also to raise some revenue, which is going to be great. Uh, we've also talked about some online courses we're trying to develop, and we're very excited by being in the forefront, we think, uh, on the Berkeley campus and doing that kind of thing. Uh, and then we talked a lot about uh, new faculty that we have and how exciting it is to have these new faculty, and it's how it's really just transforming the school. We have literally 12 new uh, lecturers, adjuncts, and faculty members uh, in the school. We have six new ladder rank faculty. If, if you don't understand these distinctions, ask an academic and they will tell you at length what all this means. Um, but we've really got an extraordinary group of new people. And in fact, one of them figures in something I'm about to do, which is Michelle Schwartz very generously has given us the funds so that we can have a professorship for an untenured faculty member, a, a ladder rank tenure track faculty member who is not yet tenured. And the idea is to help that faculty member do his or her research and get the stuff done that you have to get done to get tenure at a very tough-minded place like Berkeley. And we've got a lot of good candidates because we've just hired a bunch of great new uh, younger faculty members, but we've chosen one of those people to be the inaugural recipient of the Mil Michelle J. Schwartz professorship. And that person is Amy Learman. Amy, stand up. Wave to the crowd. Let me just tell you a little bit about Amy. She studies the criminal justice system. She's finished two books, and she's just five years out from her PhD, which is a spectacular rate of production. Uh, one book that's the University of Chicago Press and the other one which is Cambridge University Press. Uh, both of them are on the criminal justice system. They do slightly different things. One is mostly on California and talks about the experience of inmates in the criminal justice system and the experience of correctional officers in the criminal justice system. And Amy's argument is that this system is not just about trying to deal with crime that we shouldn't just be looking at the cost benefit of, is it a good idea to take criminals and put them in, away and incapacitate them, which is the, the leading theory actually of what you do with criminals these days, that just by incapacitating them, you reduce crime. So it's less even about deterrence and it's hardly at all about rehabilitation. Uh, and her theory is that we have to look at the fact that not only is there a cost benefit involved in the incapacitation, which does reduce crime and does have an impact, but there's a cost to be paid in what the criminal justice system does to the inmates and to the correctional officials. And these costs are sometimes quite significant. So for example, she's done an extraordinarily uh, innovative thing where she's looked at what's called a regression discontinuity design, explain that later uh, at length, uh, but it's a, very, it's a very sophisticated way of trying to get at causal inferences. And she has shown, I think quite convincingly, uh, that if you take inmates and you put them in the high security level with the really bad people versus putting them with the lower security parts of the prison with the bad but not so terribly bad people, that the net effect on that inmate, so you just essentially flip a coin and you go to the high security or go to the low security, if you end up in the high security area, you're going to end up with a lot worse outcomes in terms of your life, in terms of recidivism, in terms of your attitudes towards government, and your attitudes towards life. And these are bad things, obviously. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't put somebody in high security, but it does mean you might want to stop and think for a moment, what's the effect going to be of putting a person who's committed a crime with a bunch of really bad people? And that the net effect might be a school for crime. So that's an extraordinary finding. The other thing she's done is she's also done surveys of correctional officials, and she's tried to find out what it's like to operate in some of these high security prisons. 
Uh, in fact, she's gotten so involved with this that at one point she went and did a lecture at the Correctional Peace Officers Association. These are the prison guards. At their meeting, and I, I've always had, I, I, someday I've got to ask you what this was really like, but my notion is, can you imagine what it's like to have the Correctional Peace Officers Association, a bunch of prison guards, thousands I assume, in Reno, Nevada, <laughs> and to get up and lecture to them about an academic topic, like what's it like to be a correctional peace officer? <laughs> Amy did that, and I think it's an indication of her extraordinary character that she pulled it off, uh, and she was able to do it. And so she's been very actively involved with prison issues, uh, with criminal justice issues. Her second book is about how nationally the incarceration of people, which is disproportionately falls on poor people, on people of color, how that has an impact on their future feelings about government, and even on the feelings of people who have not been incarcerated, but who are in communities where a large fraction of people are incarcerated. And the net effect there is to make these communities, big surprise, very distrustful of government and worried that any interaction with government will just end badly. And so that's a cost we pay for what we do in these areas. Again, it doesn't mean we shouldn't have prisons, but it means we got to think about what are we doing with the prison system and see if we can't design it in a way that things work out a little better than they have. So I'm really thrilled that Amy will have this professorship. It'll provide her with some resources to do even more great research in these areas. Her current project is on people's perceptions of government. And one of her findings, I hope I've got this right, Amy, but is that if you ask people about a service they're getting, if the service like solid waste collection, garbage collection, is good, they presume that it's got to probably be provided by a private contractor, private provider. But if it's bad, they assume it was provided by government. And that's after you control for the quality of the service. So it's not that it's necessarily bad. So for equal quality service, you think that if it's good, it must be the private sector, if it's bad, it's got to be government. This is a very telling thing about the problem we have right now in America with respect to people's vision and feelings about government. If they think that everything government does, it does badly, that's not good. So I think this is a really important piece of work she's doing. And once again, she's using the most advanced and sophisticated social science techniques to really make convincing arguments uh, that these are really true things that are occurring out there, that people do have these kinds of perceptual biases that are obviously problematic for government. So I think she's a very deserving recipient of this professorship, and I'm very, very pleased to say she's gotten it tonight. Now, I had the fun part of, of uh, choosing Amy for this uh, award, but actually the person who made it possible was Michelle Schwartz. Michelle Schwartz is a graduate of our program. She was uh, recruited by Professor Richard Scheffler, one of our faculty members, to be the first student in our joint public health and public policy graduate degree program. Uh, at the time, she was a registered nurse, and since then, she's used her expertise in health policy to teach bioethics as a consultant at UCSF, and to do lots of other wonderful things. She's also on our board. She's a member of the UC Berkeley Foundation, a trustee. Uh, she's been a real supporter, a person who's given back to Cal. And obviously, this is just another indication of the kind of things that Michelle has done for the university, and especially for the Goldman School of Public Policy. So Michelle, I thank you. We are so lucky. And I'd like to ask Michelle to come up here and say a few words. Hi, good evening. After hearing all that, I wish my mother was here. That's the first thing I'm thinking she'd be so proud, so I'll have to just send her one of those brochures. Um, let me just say I'm really proud to be an alum of the number one ranking policy school in the country.
And over the years, I've really spoken about how the school has changed my life and affected me. But I'll boil it down right now and make it short and say I think what it's done overall is give me the ability to do some critical thinking about a range of issues in my life. And though I haven't done policy per se, I've taken these skills and these abilities across many other disciplines. So I am really appreciative of that. Um, and I have been very privileged in my life to be able to support Cal and the Goldman School over the years. So I am so pleased to be able to give Amy this opportunity and give her a professorship. And I have to tell you why I'm so excited about Amy. There are a couple of reasons. First of all, increasing the gender diversity of the faculty at the Goldman School has been a long, long range goal of the school. And I think this year, we've done it in spades. And as the research shows, not only does gender diversity increase the range of thinking and how problems are looked at and, and issues are attacked, um, but it remains to be seen how all these women coming into the public policy arena might actually change the nature of policy and what it's looked like. And so I'm really excited and, and a lot of the schools are becoming predominantly women and that'll be really interesting to see what happens down the road. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is I think having more women faculty sets role models for the women, undergraduate and graduate in the program, and gives them, a, aside from mentors, just a perspective on where they can go. And I think that's really important. Um, the other thing about Amy that I love is one of her newer projects, talking about how the public perceives information they get in dealing with their government. And it affects how they vote, it affects the public policy, and especially with the way in this country things have become, I mean, there's a partisan theater going on and we see it every day. And we know people have gotten a lot more polarized on either end, and I don't think this is good for government, it's not good for the country, and it's really important that we find ways to help people evaluate the information they get from both sides. And thank you, Amy, for doing that important work too. So all in all, I am really looking forward to welcoming Amy and, and following her work and visiting her through time here. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Michelle. It's really exciting to move forward with this. Um, and uh, it's really exciting to have all of our new faculty members as well. Uh, Alex, are you here? Alex Gelber? You want to stand up and just say hello? Is Alex here? He was here earlier. Oh, he had to go home. He's got a new baby. And at our retreat on Friday, he found a way to get the picture of the baby into his talk. We were quite impressed. But he, he felt he had to do that. I know Hillary Hoynes had to leave as well. So. Uh, we've got Amy, though, at least. And, we, and we've got several other really wonderful new ladder rank faculty, which is just transforming the school. I said earlier to somebody that I actually walk around, and Amy, you noticed this probably, I walk around in the morning and I knock on their doors and just talk to them for a few minutes because it just so energizes me for the rest of the day. It's so wonderfully exciting. So I do that. Okay. So our next speaker is... Uh, somebody who proves that the Goldman School has a lock on the governance uh, of the University of California. Now you may ask, why is that so? But last year we had a graduate of our program, Jonathan Stein, who was the student regent. And Jonathan actually spoke to our advisory board last May and was quite impressive and interesting. And now we have the current student regent who was in our public policy and international affairs program and is also an undergraduate at Cal. And she is a remarkable young woman. Um, and she went through our program. This is a summer program that we have. Uh, it uh, has occurred for over 30 years. We were an innovator in this area. We felt that if we were gonna get people involved in public policy of all sorts and descriptions, it was important to find juniors in college who were smart, 
and interesting, but maybe didn't know much about public policy. Bring them together for a seven week program in the summer where we would teach them a lot of stuff. It's actually a quite tough program with economics and statistics and law and all sorts of things, politics, um, and teach them about public policy and hopefully cause them to fall in love with it. So they'd actually go back for their senior year. They'd take a bunch of uh, courses and get ready to come to public policy school. And it's worked. It has diversified the public policy schools around the country. Now, one of the problems is we're one of the few people that do, does this, and so our students, because they've been at Berkeley for our PPIA, they often go off to other places like Harvard or Princeton or something like that. So that's a little disappointing. We don't directly get the benefits, but we indirectly get the benefits because the field of public policy is much more diverse as a result of that. So gifts, I should say, by our board members are part of the reason we can continue to have this program, and that's one of the really exciting things that I'm glad I've been able to continue. I'm, one point during the budget crunch, I was looking at our numbers and said, well, one way we could save money is to eliminate PPIA. And I thought about that for about 10 seconds and said, no, I'm absolutely not going to do that. That would be really distressing because it would mean that something that I think has really contributed to diversity in public policy would be stopped in its tracks. And we're not going to let the budget crisis lead to that. So luckily and thankfully, a bunch of you stepped up to help us continue the program. So I really appreciate your support. It's been uh, fundamental and important and allowed us to continue a program that I think is really, really important. Okay, so Sadia, Sadia uh, Saif Yudin, I hope I said that right, Sadia, is gonna be up here to talk for a few minutes about what it means to be a student regent. Sadia? Thank you. Thanks for coming. And tell us the secrets of the temple. What actually <laughs> happens inside the regents meeting. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sadia. Um, if you look in this bio booklet right here, um, you'll see me wearing the same outfit I'm wearing right now. I swear I don't wear the same clothes every day. Um, uh, it's nice to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It means a lot. Um, this summer was absolutely transformational for a number of reasons. Um, so I'll backtrack a little bit. Um, I am a fourth year social welfare major uh, here at Cal. Um, I'm also an alum of the PPIA program at the Goldman School. And this year and next year, I'll be serving as the student regent, which is the student representative on the Board of Regents for the University of California, um, which has been a really cool experience so far. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, um, I talked to Annette a little bit earlier, and she wanted me to kind of reflect on my time at PPIA and the intersectionalities of being the student regent at the same time. So. When I applied um, for PPIA in November last year, I didn't even think about student regent stuff. Like it wasn't even at the front of my mind um, that I would be applying, much less get the position. Um, and I applied for the student regent um, in February after I found out that I had made it into the public policy program at Berkeley. Um, I chose Berkeley because uh, Berkeley has been known to have an emphasis on issues um, surrounding social justice, particularly communities of color, uh, gender equity, and, and that was very important to me. Uh, as a woman of color in spaces that are predominantly dominated um, by men, it can be very hard to kind of navigate those identities um, that I have as a Muslim student, um, as a woman, as a Pakistani American. Um, and um, I thought that PPIA would be a really good way of being able to do that. Um, I was also hoping to focus on school for once <laughs> over the summer. Um, I always served as a senator last year. Um, and obviously that means that you sacrifice your entire life um, for doing stuff for the student body, which is a cool experience, but doesn't result in the highest GPA. Um, so uh, I was really excited about PPIA. Um, I entered the summer, you know, really looking forward to it and immersed myself in studies. And um, it was really great for me because I was able to, you know, tackle econ and stats. Um, and the embarrassing thing is, and I'll share this with you all because I really have no self like respect at this point. <laughs> um, um, I, this is my third time taking, taking a statistics class. The first time was in high school. The second time was for a prerequisite for my major. And both times I got kind of in grades. And so, you know, I was like, you know what? Third time's a charm. And I got an A in my stats class over the summer. So, you know, <laughs> so proud of that. Um, 
but I think the best part uh, of, of being at PPIA was the people. Um, and I'm gonna embarrass Martha for a minute. Um, I don't think I would have been able to get through the program if it wasn't for you. Um, and um, over the summer, there was a lot of controversy about my appointment um, and like allegations of like anti-Semitism and there was a lot of Islamophobia and it was really hard to get through it. Um, and I remember like a few days before our econ midterm or our statistics midterm was due, I went into Martha's office. It was the day before my appointment. And I said, listen, like, I, I'm like freaking out. Like, I, it's really hard for me to focus right now, and I don't really know what to do. And um, I, I can't really focus on, you know, on, on calculus when I, when I like, don't know what's going to happen tomorrow at the Regents meeting. And she's like, you know what? Take the evening off. Do your thing. Go relax. Just breathe. Come back. Sadia, you need to believe in yourself because you know in your heart that you're a good person and that you can do this and that you deserve this position. Um, and that was very... Um, very necessary for me to hear. Um, at a time when you doubt yourself, it's really necessary to have people in your life that encourage and, and really cultivate the leader in you um, and remind you to believe in yourself when you start doubting that a little bit. Um, so PPIA was like an emotional experience for me and um, it was Ramadan at the time as well. So I was fasting and this was one of the years um, where our fast was very long. We started at 4 a.m. and we would end at approximately 8.30 and that means no food and no drink for 30 days. Um, and I was studying at the time, um, and uh, you know, I, I remember like being in GSPP like all night, like having dinner at like 8.30, 9 o'clock, and then being up all night and having breakfast at like 3.30 in the morning and starting my fast again, and people being so supportive uh, and just being a great community. And even on Facebook now, um, you know, you'll see like the PPIA alum that were part of our program, like in DC, hanging out together, in Florida, in Texas, uh, visiting each other. I know the folks here on the West Coast are also very close. My roommate and I got very, very close as well. And really, it was just an amazing community of people. It wouldn't have been possible for, for all of you, for, you know, if it weren't for all the donors, if it weren't for the staff, um, the instructors, who were so supportive and so great in being a part of our learning. Um, so thank you so much for that experience. Um, I, I hope that you never cut the program because I, I'm here and I'm able to talk to policymakers um, on an equal footing because I can debate these issues because I know the in and outs of statistics, how people can use policy to build up leaders or build up great programs or tear them down at the same time. Um, those are things I wouldn't have been able to confidently talk about if I wasn't a part of PPIA. Um, so it, it's a different experience being able to talk to Governor Brown um, about, you know, Prop 30 and, and, and you know, the different policies that are, are a big part of our higher education system, um, you know, feeling good about what you have to say and what you've learned and what you're contributing. Um, so again, thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity for letting me talk to you all today, and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, Sadia. That, that's really wonderful. I should say also it allows me to say a word about Martha Chavez, who is our uh, assistant dean for uh, student affairs and academic affairs. Martha really is extraordinary, uh, and that story that you just heard is typical of the kind of concern she has for our students. Uh, it's fair to say our students love Martha and think she is amazing. <laughs> And the extraordinary thing about her is it also, she is the person who today gave the presentation on our executive MPA and our certificate programs and was a major force in the committee that did the marketing study this summer. Actually, we call it an audience study in academia. We wouldn't use a word like marketing. Uh, so an audience study, is there somebody who wants to listen to us? Um, and she made that happen and she gave a tremendous presentation today. So Martha, Hits, runs, by the way, where are we? In what inning? Okay, so good. So she hits, runs, fields, hits with power, does it all. So thank you, Martha. So we have a, a group of uh, folks from India who are in our executive pro, uh, education program uh, that Suda Shetty is running. And I thought maybe Suda, you would take a moment to just introduce each one of them by name so that we can have them stand up. And is Suda here? Yeah, yeah Suda, come on, come on up. 
Well, you can do it from down there if you're loud. <laughs> but this gives you ample, I mean, I, I could do it from down there because I'm noisy, but you're soft-spoken and I'm going to let you do it. That's why I called on you. Okay. So I'm actually very proud of this group because it's our first group. Uh, <clears throat> I'm very proud of this group. This is our very first group in our, we are calling it the Executive MPPI. So it's Executive Masters of Public Policy for Internationals. They're here for one semester. They can take courses up to 12 credits, 12 units and they actually mingle with students, they present for the students, they're doing a panel at the Blum Center on the, on the work that they're doing. So I'm actually very proud to introduce them to you. They are the top administrative officers of India that are here. They have huge portfolios back home, but you wouldn't believe it when you see them here because they're just like our students. So it's really wonderful to have them here, to get them to think outside the box and be out of where they are at back home. So I'm very pleased to introduce them. So Mr. Samir Kumar. <clears throat> so every one of them has over 19 years of experience, minimum of 19 years of experience to be able to come for this program. Mr. Samir is actually in charge of the biggest slum in Asia, which is located in Mumbai, and he's responsible for all the service delivery, the policy in, uh, around this issue on sanitation, water, services for this group of people that are there. How many people in the slum, Samirji? Around uh, 500,000. Around 500,000 people in what? In how much area is that? Uh, 240 hectares. That is about? That is about uh, and, uh, 600 acres. That's 600 acres of land. And it's all slum. And so he's amazing in the work that he does. So that's Amir. Um, where is Aditya Ji? <clears throat> Aditya? So there is Mr. Aditya Ji. <clears throat> so he's, his background is forestry and agriculture. And that's what his portfolio is all about. But for one year, he's taken time. He's been invited by the Department of Personnel and Training to manage all human resources for their 7 million administrative officers. Um, we have Gautam Roy. <clears throat> Gautam Roy is in charge of labor and is involved in looking at child labor issues for all of India. Amrit. <clears throat> Amrit is, we are very lucky to have a woman in this group. My guess is that for the next five years, she probably will be the only woman that will show up on this program, so I'm very pleased to have her. Her husband, I mean, Amrit is in charge of trade and commerce and responsible for all of trade and commerce for Southeast Asia, so she's doing all of the policy around that. But the best part is her husband was the police commissioner for Agra, where the Taj Mahal was. And so when the dean and Patty, we went to India last uh, November, we had the most incredible vis visit at Agra. <laughs> and it was all because of him. In fact, they blew the whistle and everybody cleared out of the Taj so that we could take a photo without the crowds. <laughs> My most embarrassing moment. <laughs> And last but not least, we have with us Mr. Morali, Dr. Morali. <clears throat> He's actually a doctor by training, but is now responsible for all urban development in the state of Gujarat. So thank you very much for making them feel very welcome. So, so we were treated wonderfully at the Taj Mahal. We, we stayed in a tent near there, and we could go to up to the top of a little hill and see the Taj Mahal. And I got up at 4 a.m. to watch the moon and then the sun play on the Taj Mahal. And for people who have not seen the Taj Mahal, it truly is the most beautiful building in the world. Uh, it's one of those things like the Grand Canyon that you can't overhype it. It's just an extraordinary place. But it was a little embarrassing when Patty and I were standing there in front of the Taj Mahal, suddenly whistles blew, and for a moment we thought, oh my gosh, we've done something wrong. But instead, they're clearing out all the people, so there is now a picture of my wife and me in front of the Taj Mahal as if we had a private visit. <laughs> Very nice, but a little embarrassing. 
but thank you very much. It was a great experience. Uh, now I'm turning to the uh, main speaker for the evening, Gary Pruitt. Uh, I've known Gary since he was a student at the Goldman School in my classes. He came as a Florida surfer boy, uh, which made him stand out a bit. Uh, and he was, I think, the only person to have a wetsuit in his locker, uh, and he would run off surfing all the time. Uh, but he really took to the Goldman School. He also got a law degree at Bolt, and, and the net result was that I think he put together the best of the law school and the public policy school. He went on to get involved with the McClatchy newspapers and, in fact, became president and CAO, CEO of them. Uh, then he most recently was appointed president and CEO of the Associated Press. And in that capacity, recently, he's had some stories to tell because some interesting things have happened if you've been reading the front page with respect to leaks from the federal government and uh, disclosure of information uh, and uh, the AP being in hot water with Eric Holder and the Justice Department and Gary, who is uh, very focused on First Amendment rights and the uh, importance of the press having the freedom to do its job, uh, really got deeply involved in trying to figure out what a better solution to the problem was than the one that first presented itself. So it's a great, tremendous, wonderful, stupendous pleasure uh, to have Gary here. And by the way, this picture, this is what he looks like in New York, and you will see what he looks like when he's in California. <laughs> Come on up, Gary. Thank you, Henry, and, and thank all of you for coming this evening. Um, I, I am a little self-conscious. I realize I'm underdressed compared to everyone else here. Uh, it is true. I, I live and work in Manhattan. I usually have to wear a suit to work, and I came to Berkeley, um, and I'm wearing jeans and a shirt untucked and no tie and no jacket. And uh, usually when I'm underdressed, my excuse is, I'm from Berkeley. That works. <laughs> That works everywhere in the world except uh, here tonight. So uh, <laughs> I know, yeah, there are others. Um, but uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what happened with the Department of Justice. And I think it helps to know a little bit about the Associated Press because it's a, it's a different breed of cat, really. Um, it, uh, it's old, it's 167 years old. It was organized by a couple of newspapers in New York to try to find a more efficient way to cover the Mexican-American War by sending a couple reporters instead of each sending their own reporters. Um, the first reporter of AP ever killed covering a story was killed covering Custer at uh, the Battle of Little Bighorn. And since then, 30 other journalists have been killed covering news for the AP. AP reports news. We strive to be objective as possible, reporting news, breaking news, and not showing any uh, bias or opinion. We don't have editorial positions. We don't endorse candidates. We try to report the news objectively uh, as possible. The AP is a nonprofit. It's been a nonprofit, which has been a structure that served it well through the Civil War, through the Great Depression. We don't have pressures from Wall Street. We don't have owners. There's no apparent or real conflict of interest. And the model is B2B, as they say in business school, business to business. Um, we don't go directly to consumers, except with a mobile app, which, by the way, is the highest rated mobile app on the iTunes store. <laughs> so um, if you don't have it, it's free. It's uh, AP Mobile News. It's, it's a, a very good uh, app. But for the most part, it's uh, business to business. We sell news, licensed content, to other media companies and academic institutions and governments, and et cetera, and they use it. Now, often other media companies republish our video, our photos, or our text, and, um, and that's how uh, AP News gets out to the world. Often you don't know it's AP News. Most video on uh, uh, US television from international sources is AP. Uh, it's not sourced that way, but they're paying us, which makes all the difference. Um, and, uh, and we're in all formats, text and photos and video. And so over time, our customers have changed. So it used to be all newspapers. Then 
radio, then television. Television are our biggest customers now. Um, U.S. newspapers are only about 20% of our revenue. Our biggest customer, and 36% of our revenue is uh, international. So our biggest customers today are the BBC, Chinese Central Television, Comcast owning the NBC networks, Disney owning ABC and ESPN, only one newspaper company. But it's a, it's a mix that AP has flexed and changed over time with the media world. And so we'll have liberal, we'll have Al Jazeera, we'll have Fox News, we'll have um, MSNBC, all of it, they all need news. They all need news from around the world. And AP has thousands of journalists around the world in 110 countries. We have bureaus where others aren't. Um, Pyongyang, North Korea. I just spent four days in North Korea uh, visiting our bureau there. Havana, Cuba, Tehran, Myanmar. Only AP is all those places. And so important for other media organizations to get that news. On any given day, over half the world's population comes in contact with AP content, more than any other media organization in the world. And so AP isn't the most glamorous media organization. It's certainly not the most profitable. We're a nonprofit. It's, uh, it's not the most well-known. But you could argue it's the most important in the sense of its reach for other people. When I became the president of AP, I told our staff worldwide that our mission is to inform the world so that kids growing up today will get a chance to go to school, get a chance to fall in love, and get a chance to be cool. Um, borrowing from Neil Young's Rockin' in the Free World. And um, there can be no higher mission than that. But we felt that mission was threatened earlier this year. Um, and to know the whole context of the story, I need to go back to May of 2012. So not this May, but a year ago, May. AP released a story to the world, to the media, that the United States had, fo the CIA had foiled an Al-Qaeda plot, Al-Qaeda and Yemen plot, to put a bomb on an airliner bound for the United States. The idea was for that bomb to go off and that airliner to go down mid-air as it was flying to the United States. It was to coincide with the, the one-year anniversary of the killing of Osama bin Laden. So this was a big story. And, um, and that's a real scoop. Only AP had that. It was broken, incidentally, by two long-term AP national security reporters who had earlier won the Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. But that story was not a surprise to the US government. Um, as the story itself pointed out, we went to the Obama administration and the intelligence agencies with this story for comment. And they said, that's a national security risk if you run that story, if you release that story. People's lives are endangered, and we want you to hold that story. And we did. We're not in the business of endangering people's lives or threatening national security. And even though we're completely independent from any government, we held the story for five days. After five days, two parts of the government, both the intelligence agencies, the, uh, the White House, told AP the national uh, security concerns have passed. They, they're allayed. And, um, and as a result, we felt we could release the story. The White House asked us to hold the story for one more day so that they could tell the story. We did not feel that was a legitimate reason to hold the story, and we released the story. Um, so the story was important in its, on its own merits because we felt the American people needed to know that, it's, uh, that such a, a plot was being planned and that the government had successfully thwarted it. But it also brought into question a statement by the White House. Two weeks earlier, Jay Carney, the White House spokesman, said, and I'll quote, we have no credible information that terrorist organizations, including Al-Qaeda, are plotting attacks in the United States to coincide with the anniversary of bin Laden's death. But here was AP finding that the CIA had been right in the middle of foiling exactly such a plot. And it turns out that the person who was going to carry the bomb on the airliner, it was a more sophisticated underwear bomb, uh, was a double agent 
working for the CIA, the Saudis, and the British. So the story got wide attention around the world, and um, it also got attention politically in the United States, because this was May of 2012. And so many Republicans thought that the administration had leaked this story to the Associated Press to make it look good, and called for an investigation. And an investigation was indeed launched. The US Department of Justice announced that it was la launching a leak investigation to find out who leaked that story to the AP and appointed a US attorney to head it up. So then fast forward a year to May of 2013. AP receives an email from the Department of Justice that it was required by law to send to us informing us that it had secretly seized our phone records of 21 AP phone lines over a 40-day period. These were thousands of phone calls and text messages, incoming and outgoing to AP. Now, AP doesn't take political positions. We don't have a political dog in this fight. We don't dispute that the government has the right to conduct leak investigations. And this administration has prosecuted leak investigation, leak prosecutions and prosecuted leakers more than any other administration in the country's history. But the Justice Department has rules about how it subpoenas and seeks information from the media and the press because we have a First Amendment. These rules date back to the Watergate era and require that any demands be as narrowly drawn as possible. Those are the exact rules. Those have to be as narr narrowly drawn as possible so as not to tread on First Amendment uh, protected news gathering material. They also require that the news organization be notified in advance, giving that organization a chance to challenge the subpoena in court, unless doing so would substantially impair the integrity of the investigation. Now, we feel that the sweep of the AP records by the DOJ leadership, I don't want to say the whole DOJ, but by their leadership, violated its own rules. Now, I, I will say this. Eric Holder, the Attorney General, recu said he, he was recused from this case. He said that because there was some, you know, some people thought, well, is he the source? So he recused himself from this case. He still had opinions about it, mind you, but, uh, which he stated publicly, but he did recuse himself from it. But we felt they violated their own rules. First, the subpoena was not focused as narrowly as possible. It was overbroad. The telephone records that they obtained were not just the work phones, the cell phones, and the personal phones uh, of the journalists involved in the case. They were the general AP numbers at our New York headquarters, in our Washington offices, in Hartford, Connecticut, and our main numbers in the House of Representatives, incoming and outgoing calls, thousands of calls. Thousands of calls used by over 100 journalists on hundreds of different news stories. And so it wasn't the surgical strike of a few carefully chosen targets. It was overbroad. It was sloppy. Some of these phone numbers hadn't been used in seven years. Um, it was a fishing expedition and uh, into scores of AP journalists' calls, most of whom had nothing to do with this, uh, the issues in, the, in question. So. This sweep of phone calls may seem minor in light of what the NSA does, um, and that they monitor the phone calls and records, you know, they have the entire country's phone records uh, collected, and I guess the entire world's, um, as we know now. Um, and, but this case really is, a l is different. In this case, the government was collecting the AP phone records not to load into a database or look at the metadata involved, but had a dedicated team of prosecutors, U.S. attorneys, poring over the records to identify specific sources matched up with journalists to locate AP's source in the story. And in doing so, they were accessing um, news gathering information related to hundreds of different stories that is protected by the First Amendment against precisely this type of intrusion. And the second way the Department of Justice violated its own rules is they didn't give us notice. They didn't let us know that they were doing this until up to 90 days later, which meant AP could not seek judicial review of this inquiry. 
they claimed that the exception applied, that if they had told us about this, it would have tipped off the leaker, and therefore, they couldn't tell us in advance. But how could that be? We didn't have, we didn't have access to the phone records, right? That was our phone service company. We couldn't tamper with anything. Um, we didn't even know they were collecting them. And would the leaker be tipped off? This was a publicly announced investigation. The leaker certainly knew about this investigation. It was announced publicly by the FBI director, Robert Mueller, nine days after the story ran. You know, our source certainly knew that he or she was um, a potential target of a leak investigation. Now, furthermore, that kind of reasoning, that tipping us off could have tipped off the leaker, telling us would have tipped off the leaker, in public investigations would apply in every single case. There's not one case it wouldn't apply. The press would therefore never have an opportunity to be given notice, and the courts would never be involved. The exception would effectively swallow the rule. Had justice come to us in advance, that subpoena may have been narrowed. I don't know, we may not have agreed. But then we could have gone to court, and the judiciary would have decided which side was right, or how to narrow it, or what to, how to handle it. Instead, there was never that opportunity, and the Department of Justice got to act as judge, jury, and executioner in secret. Now, they may have been acting in good faith. I suspect they were. Um, it's, uh, but prosecutors often get so single-mindedly focused on the targets or the subject of their investigation that they ignore other things, like the US Constitution. <laughs> and, um, and so they overlook the First Amendment implications of their actions. So I, I think that in this case, that happened. Now the outrage to the DOJ's actions was swift, loud, and widespread. And looking back on it now, I think they were surprised by the public reaction, and I was too. I was actually in South America when this story broke, and, um, and hearing about it, not the story broke, I found out about the email, of course, before the story broke, and when I thought, this is gonna be news. But I didn't think it would be front page news. Um, but it did get traction, and it got traction in May as kind of the third scandal of the day. You know, there was the IRS scandal, there was the Benghazi scandal, and there were the AP phone records. And so it sort of got traction as that third scandal, and it was on the front page of the newspapers. And um, both Republicans and Democrats took to waving the First Amendment banner at the White House, and it's one of the few, maybe the only thing this year, that um, Republicans and Democrats agreed on in the U.S. Congress um, that uh, the DOJ had overreached in this case. So we immediately, at, at this point, we had to decide, what do you do? What do we do? They've got the records, can't unring the bell. We thought, let's make sure they don't abuse these records, that they don't misuse them, and let's try to figure out how we can protect this from ever happening again. So we met with the Department of Justice, a few different meetings, and had a few different contentious phone conversations. And, um, but they did reassure us that the phone records had been and will continue to be walled off, protected, and used for no other purpose than this investigation. And we appreciated those assurances, but we wanted to make sure it would never happen again. They, by the way, strongly defended their actions and felt they hadn't violated their own rules. We felt they had, and um, these were rules put in place by the John Mitchell Justice Department. We felt they hadn't even complied with those. That really made them angry. Um, the, uh, but, so we, we called for the guidelines to be updated and strengthened, and that the administration should take strong action to ensure heightened protection for journalists and push for a federal shield law to protect sources and journalists. And to their credit, the White House responded swiftly. President Obama, ask uh, Eric Holder, the Attorney General in the Justice Department, to review and update these guidelines, their rules for handling access to material from journalists. And we found out about this on May 10th. The story broke, became big news. Um, 
late in May. I actually came to Berkeley to attend the, the Board of Advisors meeting and had to leave to go back east to appear on Face the Nation, so I missed my first board meeting because of that. And, um, and, uh, but Obama gave them a deadline of July 12th, so just less than two months um, to come back with revised guidelines. So uh, Eric Holder convened uh, meetings with journalists and lawyers and other experts uh, to produce comprehensive revisions to these guidelines. And those guidelines achieved virtually everything we asked for and that, that they couldn't do in the guidelines, they recommended through legislation. So um, we were quite pleased with these uh, revisions. In fact, if they had been in place Originally, the Justice Department could not have done what they did in our case. We believe that. The updated guidelines, um, in the updated guidelines, the Justice Department determined that advance notice of subpoenas would be given to the media in all but the rarest circumstances. And that's critical because it allows the media to go to court and involve a check and balance uh, of the U.S. government. Um, they also improved the guidelines with additional procedural safeguards. I won't go through all the details of those, but they are substantial, and updated them by bringing all forms of communication within the purview of the rules, including email and text messages that weren't even contemplated uh, in the 70s when these guidelines were drafted. The Justice Department further made clear that it will not prosecute a journalist for doing his or her job which is nice to know that in the United States it's not a crime to commit journalism. Um, we're, we're really gratified though that the Justice Department took our concerns seriously and took these critical steps to provide greater protection for journalists. I don't think the President or the Justice Department wanted their legacy to be harassing the media and I think that helped a great deal. Um, I was the chief critic of the Justice Department in this action, and I want to be uh, uh, I want to be clear about how much I appreciate the change in the guidelines. I practiced media law for over a decade. The law changes very slowly. You fight years. You get court precedents. You know, you try to change the law, and um, it, nothing happens quickly. This happened in two months. And the law changed substantially in a way that will help journalists in this country for decades. Um, because the courts have not provided the protection in this area. It has been these rules, these guidelines that, uh, in the Department of Justice that have provided the most protection to journalists um, in terms of protection of news gathering information. So I give the Department of Justice a great deal of credit. But I got to tell you, we're going to be watching closely to make sure that they're implemented and executed um, and enforced. So, and also this ruckus over the phone records breathed new life into a federal shield law, which would uh, protect journalists from revealing sources, et cetera. Last, last month, the Senate Judiciary Committee voted to approve it. The White House supports uh, this legislation. It doesn't guarantee passage, but we're hopeful. So while the phone records case for AP was a dark cloud, and I, you know, I can't say that I was happy about it, there's a bright silver lining to it. The law changed in a, in a very positive way. But nonetheless, the DOJ secret seizure of our phone records was, we view, a blatant violation of our First Amendment rights, one of the, one of the biggest violations we've ever had to deal with as an organization. And the impact goes on this beyond the specifics of this case. What are the implications? Well, for one thing, my tax returns will probably be audited next year. Um, but, but very seriously, more, I'll be ready for that. But, but more seriously, um, what I've heard from our journalists around the country is alarming. That longtime sources, trusted sources, have become nervous about talking to us. Um, even on stories unrelated to national security, they don't want their phone numbers or their names associated with it if they think they're being monitored by the government. Um, government employees we once checked in with regularly no longer speak to us by phone. Others are still reluctant to meet even in person. 
And I can tell you that effect is not just at the Associated Press. I've heard from journalists from many other news organizations telling me exactly the same thing, that uh, the Department of Justice actions have intimidated both official and non-official sources from speaking to them as well. Now, the government may love this, and I suspect they do, but I think we should beware of a government that loves secrecy too much. Um, without a free and unfettered press, the public will hear only what the government wants it to hear. We'll only hear from the official sources. And if we only hear from the official sources, we're only going to know what the government wants us to know. And that's not what the framers had in mind when they drafted the First Amendment. You don't need a First Amendment if that's the way you're going to run the country. Um, what this shows is that none of us can let our guard down, right? We, we have to uh, be vigilant because there will be attacks on journalism. These are contentious issues. Um, and when you're reporting on national security, people are hypersensitive. Um, but those are often very important stories to tell. Um, are you glad you know the disclosures of the Snowden case? It's a very different case from this one. But think what we've learned from leakers, whistleblowers, I don't know what you want to call them. I don't want to be pejorative or whatever, but uh, there are, there, we, we learn a lot. Now, also, it's more important that journalists and First Amendment activists stay vigilant because the technology that the government has, the technology that exists, period, allows government to monitor the actions and communications of its citizens comprehensively. And, um, and that technology is powerful and getting more powerful every day and difficult to put back. That genie's not going to be put back in the bottle. Um, the law may change, but um, there will, that, that kind of power is there. So a free press needs to play a constant and integral role as a check on government overreach. So, and also I can tell you I travel around the world as part of my job, APs worldwide, I travel around the world. This case has resonated in other countries um, and uh, they know all about it. I was just in North Korea, they knew all about it. They knew all about DOJ seizing APs phone records. And it's, it, it is kind of funny to think about that but you know, their actions could not have been more, the DOJ's actions couldn't have been more tailor-made to comfort authoritarian regimes. Um, because they, if they want to suppress their own media, they can say to them, the United States does it too. And it shouldn't be that way. Um, a free and independent press is fundamental to a functioning democracy. I know you hear that from the media and you kind of roll your eyes. And you know, I know the media does a lot of things wrong. And, um, and we're putting it out every day and oh, they don't stick with stories and oh, they get it wrong and you know. And, and I, I understand in academia, you're, um, you have uh, an opportunity to look at things more deeply and, and over a longer period of time and be more critical of what gets happening every day. We're churning out thousands of photos every day, thousands of news stories every day a hundred news videos every day, and that's just the AP. Um, so a lot's coming out every day. But you know, it's what we've got, right? What else have we got as a check, and why else was there a First Amendment? It's what differentiates a democracy from dictatorship and separates a free society from tyranny. So governments that try to set up a situation where trying to get citizens to think that they've got to choose between a free press and security, are making a mistake that will ultimately weaken them, not strengthen them, because that is not a real choice. That is a false choice. Thank you very much. Repeat the questions. What do you think the government's response should have been to the Snowden disclosures? 
<laughs> okay, so this is tough for me um, because it's gonna sound like I cop out on a lot of questions. The AP doesn't take um, uh, positions and I have opinions, but if the president of the Associated Press states his opinion, it sounds like the institutional view of the Associated Press. So I have to be very careful. We, we're, very, we're very outspoken about what the Department of Justice did in this case. Um, I would say this. Um, I certainly support what President Obama said when those, um, when those disclosures began coming out, and he said, I welcome this debate. Now, I'm not sure he has credibility in saying that because he tried to keep it all secret. Um, but he did say he welcomed that debate, and I do welcome that debate. I think it's an important debate for this country to have um, about whether it's better for our citizens to know that information or not. Because I think you can know that, uh, that, that those actions are, are being taken by the government without disclosing any of the details that could compromise national security any of the details of the monitoring or the, t the tech details behind it. That can be done. And uh, so is it better for citizens to know it or not know it, given, uh, given that context? Uh, and so uh, it has been embarrassing to the United States, um, some of the disclosures. I don't know if the disclosures have compromised our national security. I know there are uh, differing views on that. But uh, I can tell you in our case, no one uh, raised an issue that we had compromised national security at the time. After the DOJ took our records and we went public and it became a contentious battle between AP and the Department of Justice, several people then came forward and said, you know, this probably wasn't really in, uh, this was against uh, the national security interests of the United States that that story came out. They said it a year later it had less credibility to me. Um, no one in the intelligence agencies nor the administration said that at the time. In fact, the administration was going to reveal it at the time. On the Snowden thing, I would also say that two high government officials, including the head of US in, uh, um, intelligence in, in the White House, lied under oath to Congress about whether the US was monitoring um, phone records of US citizens. And, um, and have acknowledged that they did. And um, so it, it raises all kinds of issues at all kinds of levels uh, for the country, I think. Gary? Uh, you and I were young lawyers together fighting for a broad uh, shield law in California to some success. And I'm heartened to hear that they're actually after 30 years that there might be a federal shield law. Could you describe the um, parameters of that shield law and perhaps everybody here might be interested to know what that would mean to us as citizens? Yes, yeah, so the, the shield law offers protection to journalists which helps citizens in the sense that um, it would provide judicial oversight in these sort of cases so that uh, it wouldn't be handled just by prosecutors. Judges would be involved. And, um, we, and uh, journalists would be able to protect sources in most cases. There's a carve out for national security. It is narrow. I just don't think it's realistic in this day and age that you're, going to ha you're not gonna that, to have a shield law without a national security carve out. It's too important in post 9-11 the United States that there, there will be a national security carve out, but it is narrow. And so I think it will um, provide a greater free flow of information for, uh, for uh, citizens, for the people in the United States to, to know the goings on of their government and of large institutions, not just government, but large and powerful corporations and other institutions. And, uh, and provide greater protection for sources and journalistic uh, and, and information part of the news gathering to bring life to the First Amendment. 40 states have shield laws. The federal government doesn't. So it's not that this is an outlier. 
the outlier is not having a shield law. And so this would just bring the federal government in line with where, you know, uh, 40 of the 50 states are. Um, you mentioned, oh, I'm back here. Sorry. You, you mentioned that you uh, had held the original story for a few days because the White House had told you there were national security implications. Right. What would be your policy with respect to the same request from another government, whether Western or otherwise, and, and what would be your reasoning whether to honor that request? Obviously, going along the spectrum of right. from the U.S. on one end to North Korea at the other. Um, we would... Uh, uh, we would handle it the same way from another government. We would treat the request the same way. That is, the same process would be handled um, because we're, you know, we're not in the business of endangering people's lives or threatening security. We are in the business of reporting news and informing people so they can make informed decisions. And we would take any um, claim of national security or threat to individuals very seriously, whether it was the U.S. government or the French government or the Iranian government or the North Korean government. It doesn't mean that you defer to that request in every case, but we would treat it the same uh, in the sense that we would take it very seriously, we would evaluate it, they would give us the information that they could to, you know, if if to, so that we could understand that it wasn't an idle threat. The AP is a repeat player with the US government on these sort of issues. Um, it, and there are a few news organizations that are, including the New York Times and the Washington Post. And so these issues come up with some regularity. And so it, both sides know that. And both sides know they need to be clear and honest with each other. And we're not dealing with something that's unimportant. We're dealing with people's lives. And yet we're also dealing with important news stories. And so trying to strike that balance is important. And the government, I will tell you, in my experience, plays straight on this. Um, because they know if they didn't, it could endanger it the next time. Because they're a repeat player here, too. I'm having a hard time understanding and reconciling that a group of individuals seized a, a number of records and then in a matter of a few weeks uh, create rules that would not allow that to happen. I'm wondering how you understand and reconcile that. Yeah, so I, I, I can't speculate as to, the, as to the Department of Justice motives. I do know that the result of their actions is that it has, it, has a, it has had a real chilling effect on some sources. It's not hypothetical, it's not theoretical, it's real. So I know that that's true. I can speculate and, you know, why not? Speculate away. I, as I said, I think they were, um, I, I think they uh, didn't think of themselves as harassing the media. I met with them and they said, look, you know, we were used to be reporters. You know, these were lawyers, top lawyers of the Justice Department. We used to be reporters. You know, we're kind of kindred souls with you guys. You know, um, this, we weren't, we're not trying to violate the First Amendment here. Um, but this was a very serious case, they said, and we wanted to go after the leakers. And uh, I just don't think they, they considered the implications of their actions. Then they got huge blowback. And... Um, and the president said, I had no idea about this. I believe him. Um, and he said, we need to look at these rules and, and see whether uh, they need, they certainly needed updating and do they need strengthening. And uh, so they felt they didn't violate their rules. We feel they did. And we thought, okay, if you can interpret them that way, they've got to be strengthened so they can't be interpreted that way. We think they've now recommended that. I think they didn't, as I said, I don't think they wanted their legacy to be harassing the media. Um, by some measures, this administration has, as I said, gone after the media more aggressively than any other. And I don't think they wanted that to be their full legacy. And I think they listened to the 
arguments presented and uh, by media lawyers, by the journalists, by experts in security, and uh, honestly came up with these new rules. I give them credit for that. Uh, they feel they did nothing wrong. We couldn't disagree more with them on that uh, on, uh, originally. But in terms of what their guidelines that have come through, I couldn't agree more with them. So I, I think uh, they got their consciousness raised. <laughs> Uh, who was your telephone service provider? Who is your ISP? Who is the firm that cleans your office at night? Each of those entities has ongoing relationships with the DOJ and others. Right. And they are subject to constant, repeated requests. Have you explored your relationship with them and in turn their relationship with those for creating those requests? Yes. <laughs> in a big way. And, um, but you know, we've, and we, we don't go into all the details, but we've, we've taken steps in the past and we'll be taking more steps and have taken some to protect this kind of information. But I can tell you when it comes to phone records and these kind of subpoenas, uh, when the federal government in a criminal case uh, comes with a subpoena to a phone services company, to a phone provider, um, and they say, don't notify your customer, they don't. And we've talked to them and they said, we will never, we will, we will not, when the federal prosecutors, when the Department of Justice come to us and says not to, we don't. We, they don't want to get in trouble. So I don't hold them responsible, um, but we have to have very strong contracts with them. We've got to protect ourselves as best we can with the contracts. We've got to protect ourselves with encryption technology. And you know what? You've got to meet with sources in person sometimes. It's kind of back to Watergate, you know? Meet in the, uh, meet in the garage um, and talk. Uh, because, but sometimes the sources are the problem because they'll call in, like, yikes. Um, but, uh, but uh, so it is, uh, it is kind of a technological arms race that you know far more about than I do. But uh, we will um, we'll be working hard to protect ourselves as best we can, knowing that in some cases it's going to come down to uh, old-fashioned journalistic techniques to defeat some of the most modern technology. Hi, I'm a fellow grad uh, from the Berkeley School of Public Policy, and I wanted to ask you about your conclusion, um, because in a way it's a fairly strong statement, and I want to know if you want to qualify it or provide for further warrants to it, because in a way it could be read as you saying any time national government says there's a national security risk, you would say it's a false choice. I doubt you actually mean that. I think you probably mean to qualify it some from that. And I just wonder if you could embellish on the conclusion you drew, mm -hmm. because the conclusion comes from a single incident, and I want to understand how you really mean that, Yeah. the title. So, so I guess what I'm saying, I'm saying overall, overall, the idea that a free press and national security are mutually exclusive is a false choice. So I'm saying it globally. Um, certainly I believe it in this particular case. But what, I, I, and what I'm saying is, I'm not saying that, uh, th that we should have published when the uh, government was saying, look, there's a national security risk, we prefer you not to publish. I think we acted responsibly by not publishing and waiting until they told us the national security risk had passed. So, uh, I, but I, I, what I was speaking to when I say it's a false choice is speaking broadly, uh, in societally, that uh, the idea that national security uh, and a free press are mutually exclusive, I think is wrong. And that actually I think an informed citizenry is, uh, strengthens national security and to be able to have debates about how we strike the balance of national security can bring more support to the policy of national security, to have it 
uh, openly discussed and decided upon uh, can strengthen the national security steps that a government takes as opposed to them being clandestine and, uh, and, and then expect the, the same level of support potentially. So maybe one more question and then we're going to have somebody have a question. Where did I used to go surfing when I was at Berkeley? Uh -huh. <laughs> what are you doing in the morning? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Hurricane Sandy. Gary, I want to say that standing up to the Department of Justice, that's very admirable. I think what you did was, was great, and, and I think everyone in, here, in the room is happy that you stood up to them. But I think Doug and a couple others just really sort of hinted at the issue that what these guys have is guidelines. And without a law like the law I think that you're suggesting, guidelines sit on the shelves meant to be broken. So uh, is the idea that this law that you spoke about earlier, mm -hmm. for is that going to cure the problem? Because they should not be able to go to your service provider with a subpoena and say, don't tell, uh, don't, don't tell uh, right. the subject of, of the, the subpoena about it. And that's got to be changed. Yeah, that was their own don't ask, don't tell policy. Um, the, uh, the guidelines are part of the Code of Federal Regulations, and uh, the Justice Department relies on them as their rules for uh, seeking information from the media. So while it doesn't have the same weight as a federal statute, it does, it does provide the bulk work of protection for journalists over the decades, and I think is an important step forward. The Shield Law is related, uh, and uh, I think extremely important and, and gives life to those guidelines. So I think your point is well taken. Um, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Well, that was just an incredible talk about an extraordinary uh, circumstance and as uh, was said here, I think the fact that AP stood up to the Justice Department to get a better set of rules was really important. So congratulations to you, Gary. And uh, needless to say, uh, as a graduate of the school, we're immensely proud <laughs> and just so thrilled uh, at what you're doing with AP and uh, what our other graduates are doing uh, around the country and around the world. I'm proud to be from the school. Thank you. So thanks to everyone for coming. Uh, this is the end of the program. We really loved having you here this evening. And go forth and uh, talk to a reporter. <laughs>